TOB Advanced Techniques Disclaimer Video will cover techniques that you could use to improve your times, damage output, and survivability. Speedrun metas change constantly. This video underlines techniques that may be used in, but are not exclusive to speedruns. If you're always potted up, you'll do more damage. Fight will speed up, resulting in you taking less damage and requiring less bruise, allowing you to bring more switches into the theater. This concept applies to every room. If you are wondering whether A is better than B, it is very likely that someone has done the calculation. Use PVM Discords as a resource to find your answers or do the math yourself. I suggest looking at the Gear Discord, Oblivion Hero, or other PVM Clan Discords to find answers. This video is not about third-party clients, and I am not trying to promote them or the plugins that may be apparent in the clips used for the guide. Please refrain from asking me to send you them. All right, let's get started with Maiden. So when you walk into Maiden, you obviously want to pray mage. You want to T-bow or use any long range weapon as a first hit. When you get up close to Maiden, you want to use your special attack if you have a hammer. If you have a BGS, you want to melee or T-bow or blowpipe a few times until the hammers land, and then you want to use your BGS. The team typically wants to land at least two hammers and then BGS depending on how much damage you hit with the BGS, keeping in mind it has 200 defense. Teams can decide to have one or two players freeze Nihilicus and having the rest using Vengeance and DPSing Maiden as much as possible to increase damage. In order to freeze all of North, you need to be ready with your Mage Gear on and freeze the first one as it spawns. Then, with your weapon cooldown, you can rely on that to freeze the rest, North 2, North 3, and North 4. If you notice that you are one tick late on North 1, you can only do 1, 2, and 3, and then have your partner do South 1, South 2, and South 4. The clump can be barraged by the tanker, and then North 1, North 2, and South 1 can be dealt with a blowpipe. As long as you have reliable freezers, this is a pretty good method for Maiden. Another method is called the machine gun method. Only one person is South, freezing 1, 2, and 4 South. Everyone else is North blowpiping the first North and the second North two times each. One of these people can then freeze three and four North in order to help the person freezing South. It's important to stand on one square when you're standing North, so you get less blood toss and less possibility for blood spawns. Another possibility is to have only one freezer freeze all of South, then machine gun North one and two, clean up South one and two, and then also chain or barrage the clump. The best way to deal with a clump is to use chinchampas. Be sure to stand within 4-6 to six tiles away and be on medium fuse for maximum accuracy and damage output. Players who are not freezing can bring vengeance and cast vengeance if they are in front of Maiden or use it on another player who's tanking. When you are tanking, Maiden will drain your stats of the attack style of which you have the greatest stat bonuses for. If meleeing Verzik, you may choose to equip a ranged weapon in order to maintain your attack and strength boost. You want to have it equipped on the exact tick that she launches the projectile. You can anticipate Maiden's blood toss attack by moving right before she attacks. She doesn't perform the blood toss within three attacks of each other. At 30%, certain teams choose to skip the last wave of Nihilicus. By doing this, everyone is DPSing Maiden except for two freezers who freeze all the Nihilicus in place, and then if all of them are frozen and none of them go through, everyone focuses Maiden. You should be able to do at least one Halley at 8% to finish her off. If you have 80% spec, you can do a Clot 15 and Halley at 8%, and then you can finish her off and get her done, boys. All right, so for Bloat, I can't say too much about it because the main idea is to do a lot of damage, do your Halley specs, do your Claw specs, and try to get a two down Bloat. For this, you need Scythe, you need Max Melee, you need combat pot, you need just a bunch of damage enhancers. You can use your Halley spec before he wakes up or right after he wakes up by flinching his stomp. It's useful to eat an anglerfish right before the fight so you can have high HP. Depending on where he goes down in the room and how far he is from a corner, it may be easier or harder to flinch the stomp. You just need to make sure that you're not in his line of sight when he does stomp. If he's facing the corner, you may choose to run through him and do a drive-by. The same rules apply, you want to be high HP for this. If you have to tank the stomp and you don't have very high HP, you can choose to tick eat the stomp with a brew or a purple sweet. My visual cue that I use is when I see him stomp and the ground shakes, that's when I click on the food. People get hasty at bloat because they want to follow him as closely as possible to get to him as quickly as possible when he goes down, but if he turns directions you may be caught in all the flies. Here's a simple trick that I use in order to correct mistakes when he does turn as quickly as possible. So when you take a corner, only cross the corner by one tile. So if you want to change your mind when you see him turn directions, you can easily do so within one game tick. Now let's talk about the Nihilicus room. So because it's the same wave order every time, you need to memorize the pattern 
and that's how you'll get better at killing the room quickly. Pre-killing Nihilus as they come down the lanes is very important, especially the aggros, so that when they come down, they'll be dead and you won't take any damage. Try not to waste any time standing still, always be targeting something, know where you're going next. Memorize double spawns, scythe them if they're melee, freeze double majors, but be careful as a major, don't freeze everything at the beginning, especially not single spawns, because your trident is one tick quicker than a barrage. So this room really is a team effort. If someone's not pulling their weight, it'll show. Um, you really just want to make sure that whenever your weapon cooldown is up, you're ready to attack, and just think ahead, so know what you're doing in advance. For the Nilo boss, you want to focus on pre-switching before he changes color. Pre-switching into melee and range because those are your highest DPS options. You can also opt to wear full bandos for your second melee hit in order to get more DPS. So in this scenario, it's mage. Melee is better DPS and range, so I'll go into melee. If it's range, I'll just change to range. Now I'm going to go into melee because melee is more DPS than mage. So right after the boss does its second attack of its current form, and right before it changes, you should have switched all of your gear and your prayers. And when it changes color, if it's the correct color, then you can just attack it. If it's not, then you can correct your changes with your prayer first and then your gear and then attack the boss. Because the boss only has 50 defense, if you have a BGS, you can BGS it down as a first hit. Other options are using a claw into the Halley for the second hit. At the very last phase, if it happens to be melee, try to finish it off with the Halley as well. All right, let's talk about Sotaseg. So in a team of four or less, you want to be five tiles away from your teammates. What this does is an orb will never hit you at the same time as he melees you. So this formation works, and this formation can be rotated clockwise diagonally by one tile. As you can see, every five ticks, the melee prayer is up. If Sotoseg chooses not to melee and throw a projectile, that projectile hits the players six ticks later. So just to show this in more detail, the melee prayer is up. Five ticks later, melee prayer is up again and then the mage prayer is up for that projectile. I recommend learning how to flick like this because when you take less damage, you can now put more damage because you're not brewing down. Ticketing the ball can be good for certain situations. So what you wanna do is click on your food when he begins the animation of his next attack. Another visual cue is to tick eat when the ball enters your body and if you're very far away, tick eat when the ball touches your forehead. Now remember after tick eating, you're very low HP so in order to avoid all of his melee attacks, you can flinch him and only pray against his orbs. So when you start the room, obviously you can do a Tebow hit before you get into melee distance. And the team wants to strategically spread out the special attacks throughout the whole fight. So coming out of the maze and at the very start, you want to have two hammers from the team and then a BGS if the hammer's missed. At the end of the fight, when he's around 3%, you can go ahead and use your Halley. This usually works when his defense was lowered after the second maze. You can also use Vengeance and disable your protective prayers, and maybe enable Redemption just in case. So in order to do the maze effectively and efficiently, you have to have a good knowledge of how pathing works, and you just need to be comfortable with your clicks, and obviously you want to be on a low ping world. I'll leave a link in the description of this very cool tool that you can use to practice running your maze. It uses the same sort of tick delay system that we have in game, so it feels very familiar and it's a very good tool to practice. Other than this really cool tool, there isn't much to say about the maze. Just make sure that when you come out of the maze if you're low HP, pray melee because if you're in melee distance, he can melee you instantly. Okay, let's talk about Zarpus. So, for Zarpus, essentially you want to kind of spread out in part one so that you can cover the most amount of ground with your teammates and coordinate with them so that you guys can efficiently cover the exhumes. At the beginning of the fight, you obviously want to use your hammers before you use your BGS. If Zarpus still has a defense level of around 10 or higher, the scythe is better than dragon darts in a blowpipe. So the best DPS during stair phase is a scythe, max melee, of course, potted to 118 stats. And the pattern to use a scythe is a 5 tick weapon on a 4 tick cycle, it'd be a 2 2 1 2 1. So over here we have one hit, here we'll have two hits, then here we'll have one hit, and then here we'll have two hits, and then here we'll have two hits again. Then here we'll have one hit. Then here will be two hits. Finishing off with a Halley is obviously the best thing to do if you have 30% spec. So you want to do more damage at Zarpus, right? But the scythe method, you're losing a hit every four cycles. So what if you can hit Zarpus 
every time your weapon cooldown is up. So it hits Arpus every five ticks. This is what you are probably already used to using your scythe. So you have your first cycle, you hit on the first tick. Second cycle, you hit on the second tick. Third cycle, you hit on the third tick. And then obviously over here, you miss a hit because you're using a scythe, which is a five tick weapon on a four tick cycle. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna unhide these columns and we're gonna introduce a new cycle over here. This is gonna be the face tank cycle. This is where you purposely stand in melee distance of Zarpus because you wanna melee it, but you're also aware that this tile is going to get splatted. These three cycles over here, you're going to be splatting the regular tiles that are two tiles away from Zarpus. But over here, you're gonna be splatting a tile in melee distance. So let's just keep one tile in melee distance splatted and keep the others clean as much as possible. So for those of you who are a little bit more visual, I've uh, drawn a Zarpus layout over here. So let's just say that you were standing at this tile and you were mailing from here. So you did your first, second and third scythe cycles. And then typically now you would skip a cycle by going here and going back without attacking him. Instead of doing that, well, put yourself in this position over here, get ready to attack Zarpus and flinch onto this tile. This tile either has acid on it already or it will have acid because you're attacking and you're face tanking him during the phase that he will be splatting you and, and scanning your tile. And then you can restart your scythe cycles one, two and three before coming back again to this area and attacking Zarpus and landing on this tile again when he's going to scan your location. You're essentially splatting the same tile on and on again and it's no big deal because during the stair phase you don't really need this tile. Starting off with the two Warhammers at the very beginning. This is the pattern I like to start off with. I only do this if I'm not the first person in the orb so that I don't get targeted first. This is the face tank. And now we're on scythe cycle number one. Scythe cycle number two. Scythe cycle number three, and then get ready for the face tank. And then back to scythe cycle number one. Number three. All right, getting ready for the face tank. And I can even change sides if I want to. Number one. Scythe number two. Scythe number three. Now I get ready for the face tank. And back to one. Number two. Number three. Not an ideal path right there, but it is what it is. Number one. Number two. Number three. Again, not an ideal path over here. So you can do this taking a lot less damage if you optimize your path, but the pattern is there. The final challenge is Verzik, and throughout this fight, you want to try your best to be potted 118 combat stats as much as possible. During pillar phase, the meta is to use full bandos or maximum strength and piety. Although damage is randomly capped between 1 to 10, you'll have more potential to hit that cap. So you can get two scythe hits and you can get one staff hit from the pillar while you're going towards Verzik. This is assuming that you are tick perfect. If you lose a tick, then you're going to have to skip one of the attacks in order to get back in cycle. A visual cue I use to help me know when to click on Verzik when I'm at the pillar is when she opens her legs. Don't ask, it, it works. Trust me. Certain teams choose to drop the staff in front of Verzik instead of at the pillar. This is great because you can use the staff as a pre-hit while running towards Verzik to use your melee. However, this requires coordination. During part 2 Verzik, instead of freezing the crabs when they spawn, you can choose to detonate them. Best case scenario, you can continue doing DPS while doing so. If you are very very low on restores, or you're an Iron Man and you want to conserve your restores, then you can choose to one tick prayer flick phase 2. It's very very click intensive, but it does work. I recommend putting Verzik next to your prayer orb and using the minimap to click back. With a ranged pot, in certain situations of duos and trios, it might be beneficial to have one player blowpipe the Nihilicus. Just keeping in mind that once they're low HP, you can always get back on Verzik and help with the DPS. It's also a good idea to use your claw spec or your Halley spec at the very, very end of part two in order to push 
that phase into part three and skip another potential red spider phase. Versic web phase is almost like free damage. What you need to do is make sure you start on the right tile, and you need to make sure that you wait a tick at the very beginning before starting your run. The consensus is to start south and then run clockwise. Hit once from the center of each side and then run to the next side. By doing this, you minimize the chance of anyone getting stuck and you minimize the chance of you getting one ticked by the web. But even if you do it perfectly, there is still a chance that you can get one ticked by the web. It's very rare, but it could happen, like in this case scenario. You can use a Halley special attack right before portal phase. If your portal is far away, then you can get into some range gear and throw a Tebow hit before coming back into melee distance. If the fight happens to take long enough for the green ball to come out, you can camp between 75 and 83 HP and activate Redemption. When Verza goes into phase 3, it's important to get your attack off immediately on the first available tick. And then, if you're using a scythe, you can do a 2-1-1 pattern. If you're using a whip, you can do a 2-2-1 pattern essentially stepping under Verzik before she attacks. You want to keep Verzik as close as possible to the center, so when she goes into web phase, she doesn't have to walk too far. Her yellow portal attack can be tricky during tornadoes. It's important that you learn to time it properly. If you don't think you can make it, just camp high HP, brew up, and then get ready to continue DPSing. If you are not tanking during the final part, the last thing you should do is get caught by the tornado. A very good trick to do this is to snake side to side, or simply go around Verzik. After you get an XP drop for attacking Verzik, make sure you path away from the tornado to distance yourself as much as possible. Now, if you are tanking, there is a method going around called the Pog Tank. And this method was first introduced by Exact in a video. I will link it in the description. So because when tornadoes come out, Verzik becomes enraged and she attacks every five ticks instead of every seven ticks. Now, she attacks you at the same speed as your scythe. For this reason, you can exchange a 1 to 1 attack ratio with Verzik. And you want to be underneath Verzik before you attack her, so that when she scans to see if you're in melee distance, she won't find you because you're under her and she won't melee you. So this is Verzik's surface area. U represents the fifth tick in the cycle, and let's just assume that that tick represents the tick that she scans you, it's the tick right before she attacks. And then the A is the first tick in the cycle in which you attack Verzik and she attacks you. So by doing this, um, you will never get meleeed. And then you do attack, step, 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 under, attack, step, 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 under, attack, step, 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 under, etc. So that's the basic pattern. And to set it up, you just want to attack Verzik at the same time as she attacks you. So one trick to do that is to look for the message on top of her head. Once that message disappears, one tick later, click on her, and then it should work. So this method is definitely not necessary, and there are easier ways to tank Verzik. And if you're in a big team, you probably won't be tanking for too long, so it might not be worth setting up. But it's really fun, and it could prove to be useful for smaller scale teams. Just remember that after the green ball, you have to wait two extra ticks in order to compensate for the delay. And I think that's going to be it for the video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. Obviously, I could not have done this video alone. I want to give a huge shout out to XBay and Vuel for providing clips that I use in the video. Of course, a big shout out to Exact, who has an amazing series of guides on the Theater of Blood, and they're very quick guides, so if you're into that kind of thing, I'll leave a link in the description. And also, I want to thank Dio for being the fuel to my motivation, always helping me out making these guides, and inspiring me to want to understand more about the game. And that's going to be it. I'll see you guys next time.